So welcome to our first presentation for 2024. This is uh, Modeling 101, the absolute basics of starting out modeling. Now, we were going to tell you, if you're already a modeler, an experienced modeler and that, by all means, do not watch this. There's nothing in this for you. <laughs> but then I rethought my position. I thought, you know, myself and Ian are going to sit here and tell you how to get started, the basics of modeling. Since we've all done this journey, maybe you have some ideas we missed. Maybe you have a better way of doing things. Maybe you have an alternate way of doing things. So what we would like you to do is watch this thing and then leave some comments below to help guide new modelers. We can't just do it on our own. As a community, we should always be encouraging new modelers. And speaking of which, I'm Bill. I'm the owner of the Hobby Center, uh, coming on 37 years in business. I've been a modeler since I was eight years old. That's probably why I got into business. And this is my associate, Ian. Hello there. And I've been modeling, uh, yeah, uh, some 60, almost 55 years, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, learned a few things along the way. Uh, not, not, not a lot, I guess, but a few things along the way. Yeah, so we, we, we wanted to do this for, for two distinct audiences. Uh, youngsters getting into the hobby, and oldsters either getting back into the hobby or trying it uh, for the first time, uh, you know, retired, looking for something to do. And that, that was uh, that was who we want uh, wanted our audience to be. Very good. So you got a model. Somebody gave it to you for Christmas or for your birthday, or you were just in a hobby store. You could have been in Value Village and you saw a model and you said, "I want to build that model." So now you have said model in your hand. Where do you go from there? That's what we're going to cover right now. So first thing you have to consider, I think, is what do you want to do with your model? Yeah, do you want it to be just a fun project where you're going to build it and, you know, maybe just put it on the shelf? Are you going to try to make it as accurate as possible because you're making it look like the car that you had when you were a kid? Uh, are you doing it just, um, you know, to try it out and say, gee, I, I want to see if I like this hobby or not? So first thing is just to, to get an idea of why you want to do it. Well, that's it, exactly it. And, and there's no right or wrong to it everybody's level of enjoyment is different. So what all models share in common is basically they're a box of unassembled, unpainted parts, on trees. Uh, some of you might think of it like a puzzle. If it's like a puzzle, you put the pieces of the puzzle together and you hopefully end up with something that looks like the box top. Now the different models that are out there will help you along with this because a lot of the models have a legend on them that tells you how difficult they are. So for this one here, you can see it's got a 1 to 5 rating. 1 is for the absolute beginner, 5 is for the, uh, the you know, the, the pretty accomplished modeler. So you can see that this one on it right here has the number 4 on it. So you'd know if you were just starting out, if you pick this one up, it might be a little bit much for you. So you, the, the lower the number, the uh, the more basic the model, and, and it basically means less parts, less difficulty uh, putting it together, and um, generally just sort of, sort of a more of a beginner kit. Now, scale modeling is also considered a form of art. So once you get experience and you've done a few, if that's the direction you want to go, you take that set of parts that I showed you earlier and then you want to make it look as much like the artwork on the front or pictures of the real thing as you can. That's a whole process. That involves a lot more than gluing parts together and throwing some decals on. There's a whole sequence of things to do to get a basic box of parts to look like a realistic replica. So we think of it like a canvas. If you're an artist and you have a canvas for a painting, it's just a white you know, piece of cloth basically until you paint the picture on it. So we look at models as a bunch of unpainted, unassembled parts that we are going to put together and we're going to make it look as realistic as possible. It's going to tell a story hopefully when we're done. That's what drives a serious model. But there's all kinds of area in between from the guy that just slaps the puzzle together to the guy that builds the most accurate replica he can. It's about your enjoyment, what you want to get out of the hobby. That's what we said. What are your goals? What do you want to take away from this? And that's a personal decision. And don't let anybody else tell you. You get your enjoyment the way you find it. And the other thing is when you're, when you're starting out, there's a lot of stuff online now. There's all kinds of, uh, 
uh, of uh, YouTube videos and stuff. We get people in the store all the time saying, oh, I just saw this video and I, I want to make this. And uh, and you say, have you ever built a model before? And they say, no, I've never I've never built a model before. And they're, you know, it's, it's like somebody coming in and saying, I've never painted before, but I want to paint a Rembrandt. And um, so, so just try to try to remember to not uh, not run before you can walk. And you know, if, if you build the perfect model the first time out, there there's nowhere to go from there. You can't go up from there. So just be realistic about how it's going to turn out. I, I would suggest that if it's your very first model, um, I wouldn't even worry about painting it unless it unless you, you know kits like this they come with paint. That's perfect for that, but. You know, a lot of the stuff, you can get a good model and a decent looking model just by putting the duckles on it. Certainly for Bill and I, when we first started out, we never painted anything. It was a big major step to jump in. So just think about it. Think about your abilities. Think about what you've done before. And um, just, just make sure you don't run before you can walk. Sure enough. And there's a progression. The first model you make, you think, hey, this is pretty cool. And you'll be very proud of it. And well, you should be. But then when you deal six or ten of them, you're going to look at that first one and go, man, I can do better than that. <laughs> and as the years go by, you'll look at the ones previously, and it's just, it's just a growth thing, that's all. But you will get better the more you do it, like anything. Practice makes perfect, right? So going back to selection, we, we started out our little talk by saying, you know, you were given a kit or you found a kit. Well, say you don't have a kit, and you're going out to buy your first kit. What should you look for? And Ian gave you a good idea of the first one. This is a complete little set. It's got your glue, it's got water-based paint, it's got a brush, and it's got your kit. So think of it like a craft kit. It's complete. Everything you need is there. You can put this together and make yourself a nice little model. And I really recommend this to new people, especially parents and grandparents trying to get their kids to do something because it's a complete kit on its own. Nothing left to buy, and you either enjoy it and you move on from there, or you go, eh, it's not for me, no harm, no foul. It was a complete package, one and done. Or it starts you on a journey that could last a lifetime. What would you think of a, as another idea? Well, you want to pick something that, that you're passionate about. Um, there's a lot of different types of models out there. You can buy airplane models, you can buy tank models, you can buy car models, motorcycle models, ship models. There's a little bit of everything. Um, buy something that you're interested in and uh, I think you'll find that that gives you a little extra kick to, to get it finished. If you really like cars, then build a car. When I was a little kid, uh, I used to always pick the models I built by, based on the ones that had the metal axles because then you could play with it and uh, I would build it up and make it as good as I can and then I would play with it. So that was always the, 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 the reason that I would pick those particular kits. But if you pick something that you enjoy and that, that you know a little bit about, we get a lot of people in here, a lot of adult modelers that are ex-military and they're coming in looking for models of uh, vehicles that they may have served in, airplanes, tanks, that sort of thing that they may have served in. So if you find something that you're really interested in, uh, you, you'll find that your journey goes better. Sure. And if you talk to somebody in the store, like ourselves or one of our many staff, they'll give you some ideas. You know, if you, you're completely lost and you don't know. Like one thing I, I recommend is snap kits. You know, you think, ooh, snap together kit. What's the challenge of that? It is a simplistic design. There's, you know, a minimum of parts in there. But you can still, even though it's a snap, you can still glue it and you can still practice good assembly procedures to make that snap kit look good. You know, just breaking the pieces off, slapping them together, you're going to end up with something that's probably very quickly done and it looks like it was quickly done. Even the simplest model with a few basic techniques can be made to look pretty cool. So, you know, if you want to start with a snap together for the simplicity and then apply some of the things we're going to show you today, that's a good way to start. Now the other thing is, say you like airplanes, we always recommend something simple. This is a World War II single engine monoplane, meaning one wing, one prop, very basic kind of design. You don't want to get the Lancaster bomber with four engines, <laughs> tons of bombs, or that F-14 Tomcat with the swing wings and all kinds of Phoenix and Sidewinder missiles and drop tanks and all kinds of things just hanging off that thing. That will probably frustrate a new modeler. 
So we like to go simple for the early ones. Um, if you shop the cars, for example, you will find cars that have several hundred parts. You will find cars that list they might have 60 or 70 parts. So what they're called is curbside. You don't have all the motor and motor bits and everything. There's probably something representing a motor in there, and most of the emphasis is on the outside of the vehicle. So you can focus on making a nice car replica without overcomplicating the first one or two. So these are kind of things to look for. And as I say, we would guide you in that sort of direction if you ask us for our help. Yeah, and a lot of people do that. A lot of people come in, they're buying a model for their son or their grandson or somebody in the family, granddaughter. And um, so we'll try to lead them on, you know, and find out what they like, what they're interested in. You know, oh, they, they like war movies. Okay, well, they like doing war movies. Maybe a tank, and, and uh, you know, work on it from there. Follow along so that you, you have, uh, you know, that they're getting them something that's the, the type of thing that they should be building at their ability level, but also something that interests them. So we're going to talk about this little jet model that we have here. It's an old Airfix kit. We're going to sacrifice this up just to show you <laughs> basic techniques in that. Now, I've always said if you just want to put a model together. You want to treat it like a puzzle, you just want to assemble the thing to see how it goes and, and you may go after that, you may stop right there. That might be the only enjoyment you want to get out of it and that's fine. You only need four basic things. You need some kind of glue. This is the one I like to use, Tamiya cement. You need a pair of cutters to take the pieces off the runners. You need a sanding device, in this case it's a Hobby Center sanding stick. Yes, there is a commercial going on here. Well, a well used one too. Yes. <laughs> These are from my own kit. We, we brought our own stuff to show you the things we actually use. So I didn't just pull these off the counter. You can see they're well used. And I think you should have some kind of knife. In this case I have uh, an Excel or Exacto style number one knife. So with these four things you can put together any model. You can take your model, you can take the sprue cutters, and you can safely cut the piece off. Never twist the piece off because you'll, you'll often tear a little chunk out of the part. So you always want to have something to cut it off with. Now I don't know if you can see it very well in this one. See the little nib where I cut it off? And there's also a thing called flash. Flash occurs when they inject the plastic into a mold and a little bit of it seeps out. You don't want that. So there's where your sanding stick comes in. We sand off the flash and we sand off the little burr. And we just clean them up. That is one of the most elemental parts to the hobby. That flash was a little thicker than I wanted. I can just use my knife and I can cut it or scrape it off. You want to be able to prepare every part and the other thing is, before you glue them, you want to be able to fit them in and make sure that you've got the right part in the right spot and that it fits. And if it doesn't fit, sometimes it doesn't fit because you've forgotten to cut off a little burr or there's a little bit of plastic in the way or something. So before you commit to the glue, always make sure that you've, you've put in the, you know, the, the, the time to make sure that the parts as you're going along are, are, are in good shape and, and ready to go. So I got a little ahead of myself there. I just kind of show you why those are the four essential tools. Now before we even did anything here, we should take our new kit. We should make sure it has its instructions. It has a decal sheet. Most models have some kind of decal sheet. It's kind of an old one. You can see it's curled. And then you should take your parts out of the package. and you can kind of familiarize yourself with the instructions or in some cases and not this one unfortunately the the model manufacturer will give you a picture of all the different part trees and you can sit there and you can compare and make sure that you have everything the worst thing you can do is start a kit and then find out you know well into it that you're missing a part or a part was not made correctly yeah, occasionally the parts don't form properly uh, in the mold and usually those are rejected at the factory but occasionally you get it where it shows up on the and so you, you want to 
just check everything over first, just to make sure everything's there and everything's working and proper. Like you said, there's nothing worse than getting three quarters of the way through and finding out you've only got one landing gear. So we're looking at this one. You know, this was a kit we got from a collection or something. So it wasn't brand new and I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm seeing everything is pretty well there. So I'm satisfied with what I have here. Now, with myself, I, don't, I can't speak for Ian, I would take the instructions and I'd read them thoroughly. Sometimes they give you little ideas and tips of things to do. In some cases they give you alternate uh, methods or things. If you want to make this version versus that version, you have to plan that into the build. So I would take this thing and I would read it like a magazine. I would read it several times. Uh, if I'm doing that alternate version, I might take a pencil and I would circle the parts that are pertinent to what I want to do. And then I might take my instruction and I might go to my computer and I might look up the, this is a British Aerospace Red Arrows Hawk. So I might go look at pictures of the real thing, or I might find build reviews online. Somebody who built this kit, see what he had to say, and he can save you a few pratfalls. He said, oh, part A and B didn't fit together, I had to sand off a little bit of whatever. If you find that out, that can save you a lot of hassle and make your build that much smoother. One of the things that, um, not frequently, but often enough happens in uh, in models is there'll be several different versions of a model and there's an, an instruction sheet for it and occasionally the instruction sheet is for all of the different versions so you have to know which version you've got in your building and unfortunately with some of the manufacturers the, the instruction sheets aren't necessarily right because they've, they've mixed and matched cut and paste from different instruction sheets so this is where a uh, looking up at a video about it really helps because you'll often find the guy will say it says in step two to attach part B2. It's not B2, it's D2. And uh, that, that really helps when you're going along because if, if you're new to it and you don't understand, uh, you know, the parts, it, 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 it could kind of throw you off. So I read my instructions, I did a bit of studying, I looked at my parts, I'm satisfied with what I've got. I've been mentally, I'm already thinking about how I'm going to do this thing. And that's one of the fun parts about the hobby. As your brain starts percolating, you start planning the attack, how you're going to do it, what order you're going to do it, you know, when you want to get it done or give yourself a deadline if, if there's such a thing. Now you're ready to build. So here's the first consideration. You have to have a work space, okay? If you're working on your kitchen table or your favorite desk or something, put some protection down. You know, you're a new person starting out, you're not investing a lot of money in meeting. Get a piece of simple cardboard, just so you can glue and cut on it and, and save whatever surface you're working on. You'll make your mother, your grandmother, your wife much happier if you do this, <laughs> trust me. Yeah, we've all had that story where we spilled paint on the dining room table or something like that and lived to regret it. So that's, that's, very, good, uh, that's very good advice. Uh, for people like us where we, you know, it's our number one hobby, I have a, a specific area in my basement that, that I model. I have lots of light because I'm old and need lots of light. I have uh, different cutting surfaces. I have a big IKEA desk. I have a comfortable chair. I have music. I have everything that I could want and it's just sort of a little man cave to do it. But obviously when you're starting out, you just want to try, you know, you, you can work up to that if you decide it's your lifelong hobby. But you don't want to be uh, you don't want to be cutting into mom or, or or your wife's dining room table. I did have lighting down as a consideration for your workspace. Lighting is important. If you don't have good light, it's hard to see the parts. It's hard to see what you're doing. And trust me, I've been wearing glasses forever. Eye strain is a thing, especially as you get older. So lots of light is good. If you're a uh, an older modeler getting back into it, I recommend that you get one of these things. So just a little visor that you wear on your head, just like this. You pull it down and you can see what you're doing. Um, it's very, very common that the parts are too small for you to be able to focus on. This helps. You see any modeler over 50, that's what they're wearing. The third key thing I want to talk about is ventilation. So there's ventilation for using these various toxic glues and adhesives and stuff. 
And if you get into painting and things like that, there would be fumes from various types of paints and solvents and stuff. And it's very important that you have good ventilation. You don't want to sit in the corner of your basement with no air movement because this stuff can be dangerous. You've got to treat it properly. So make sure if you haven't got a window that you can open or something, get a little fan. Get something moving down there so you're not sitting there just inhaling all the stuff that you're working with. Yeah, on my workbench at home, I have a little uh, four-inch computer fan, and it just sits on the corner of the table. When I turn on the lights, it comes on. You don't really feel it. It's, it's not enough that it's blowing the papers off your desk, but it keeps the air moving, so there's no concentration of the fumes while you're working on stuff. So you've got your workspace. You've done your research. You've inspected your kit. You've got your stuff ready to go. You start at the beginning. Take your instruction sheet, especially if you're just new to the hobby. They're numbered for a reason. Start at number one, do what it says for number one, and then follow to number two, number three. Somebody took the time to do this thing, an instruction manual, kind of like a recipe, and for us people that are new to the hobby and that, you just follow it right along in sequence, and it should provide you with a successful journey. Once you get more advanced and you, you want to paint, you want to do extra detail, you want to make it personalized, then you can jump around. You can do what they call sub-assemblies and stuff and then put the whole thing together at the end. But for a new person, I strongly suggest follow the sequence in order as written. We'll say you. I agree 100%. And also, remember that this is a time to be a little bit on the patient side. The way the glue works is just like the way you weld metal. It actually melts the plastic a little bit together, and the, 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 part, the, the, the two parts of the plastic come together, and then the gas uh, gas is off, and then you have your, uh, your joint. And the joint is actually quite strong, and in many cases it's stronger than uh, any other part of the model, but it does take some time to dry. Um, if you're trying to go too fast and you've glued pieces on and they're not dry, you're going to find you may you may move something or a piece may fall off or that sort of thing. Um, so try to be patient when you're putting this stuff together. Um, unless it's a very basic model, don't assume that you're going to build it all in one session. You may uh, build a few parts, you know, let them dry, go do something for half an hour, come back to it, and those parts will be dry and you can go on from there. So we've got our kit here. We're not going to follow the sequence because we're just going to show you a few ideas. Now, I've got what I can see here is an upper lower wing and two upper parts that are going to go on the wing to make a complete wing. So as we said earlier, here's your part. I want this wing off. Okay. We don't want you doing this. Now, in this case, I didn't do too badly, <laughs> but there was a chance that on that upper end, I could have taken a chunk, like it can go either way. I can take a chunk of the tree off with me, or I leave a chunk of the model on the tree. And if you leave a chunk of the model on the tree, you're gonna end up with a model that has like, looks like little bites all over it, and it's not attractive. I don't think most of us would be happy with that. So instead, as I had showed earlier, one takes one's clipper to remove the parts. You get in nice and close. Put the, usually the clippers have a flat edge. You can see there's a flat edge to it. You put the flat edge against the part you want off and carefully snip it off. That's like probably the most basic thing you'll do, but it is fairly important. Then once you have your part off, you run your finger along it and you can feel that little burr where it was attached. And trust me, when you build that model, you're going to see those little burrs. They're going to stick all over like a little porcupine or something. So that's where your sanding stick comes in. Just give it a bit of a rub and get rid of it. Now an important thing about the sanding sticks is it's divided up in half and there's four different grits on it from, from very rough and very coarse to very fine. So start off with a more coarse end of the stick, take off the part, and then if, it, if it's got a little bit of marks on it, you know, just go down to the, the, the next less coarse, right down until you get to the fine one, and it'll be like there was never anything there. 
So I'm back to my wing, my lower wing, and my upper wing half, okay? So what it wants me to do is glue the lower to the upper. So it looks something like that, all right? So we're time to glue. Now, what kind of glue do you use? That's a personal decision as well. Most people new to the hobby will start with what we call a tube cement, okay? Lepages used to make it, they may still, we don't carry it. Uh, testers made it, we stopped carrying that because of the experience. This is one of the current favorites, which is the Revel Contacta. And this will do the job. You know, you get a little tube of glue in those little uh, starter kits. This is the traditional form of building models. It has been for years. And of course, you probably heard all the horror stories about getting high from this stuff. Well, whatever was in it that made you high isn't in it anymore. So breathing this stuff is just going to give you a headache. So don't go there. <laughs> it's still worth building models. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so if you opt to use this, which you will do as a new person, advanced people typically don't, but I know some really, really good modelers that swear by it, and they still use it to this day. Contest winners even. Think of it like toothpaste. The rookie mistake would be to take your part and take your glue and we'll put it all on there like toothpaste or brill cream or something and then stick that part in there. So you do that. Okay, and it will work. The part will go on there and you hold it. Now, the glue will ooze out all around. If you put an excess like that, you squeeze that on. Just, just think of putting a peanut butter sandwich. Oh, it's going to squirt out all the edge. And that's going to be a mess. That really is. You're going to wipe it off or do something with it. It's going to smear your model. And it, you're really not going to be happy with it. So if you use this type of cement, and again, it'll work. It'll do what you want. Get something disposable. A piece of cardboard, a piece of tin foil, a little lid off of a, a bottle, anything you want. Put the glue, an amount of it on there. And then dip the parts or use a toothpick to apply it sparingly. And if you've got little location pins, I don't know if you can see them on there, there's little locating pins and there's little matching holes on the other part. Put the glue on those parts and then put it together. The other problem is, if you remember I said that the glue actually melts the plastic a little bit. If you have too much glue and you squeeze the part down, the glue comes out everywhere. If it goes underneath your fingers, you're going to end up putting fingerprints into the plastic of your model and they're very hard to get out again. So less glue is better. You can always go back and re-glue it if it didn't quite uh, glue perfectly the first time. Too much though and you'll, you'll have a mess. Now the people that make that glue also make the same type of glue but it comes in this nifty little bottle with a needle applicator for precision gluing. So you could take this now I would practice a little bit. I don't know how fast or, or hard that would come out, but you could apply it, you know, on the little spots that we discussed on the edges. You just got to be mindful of how quickly the stuff is or isn't coming out. The other thing you would have to be aware of is you need something very small, like a piece of wire or something, to get in there to clean that nozzle. Because I should imagine that the glue may dry in the nozzle there, and think, yeah. so you need something to clean that out. We sell a lot of it, and the, the feedback is very good about it. Again, it's not something I use, but we do sell it a lot, and it does get used by a lot of people. This is just another type of tube cement. This is probably this is the same company I think that makes the stuff that's in the Airfix kit. And then, of course, we've got our solvent glues. These are different glues. They come in bottles with brushes, and these are actual chemical solvents, uh, kind of like nail polish remover would be an example but it's not really made for model plastics it, it will do stuff to them but not probably it's probably too harsh too smelly like you got to consider what you're breathing too right so this stuff is for polystyrene plastic which is what model plastic is it won't glue all plastics together you know a lot of people come in i want to buy this to fix a plastic piece of my car Plastics are all plastics, but not all plastics are made the same. So this is specifically for polystyrene plastic models. So always get stuff that says on it, even if it's a glue that says it'll do a lot of different ones, make sure polystyrene is in the list.
Yeah, because that's what almost all injection molded models are made out of. And again, it, it won't melt the plastic and join the parts together if it's not uh, the right uh, combination of, of solvent and plastic. So I'm using my trusty Tamiya cement, which I like. I'm going to put a bit on this thing. Now, what, as soon as you put it on there, it's starting to soften the plastic. So you don't see it. It doesn't look wet anymore, but it's doing stuff to the plastic. You put the piece on, you hold it, number of seconds, and that piece will be on there. Now that's one way to use plastic cement. The other neat thing about the properties of plastic cement is that, say you put that wing half together first without glue, you can take that tiny brush and you can run it along the seam. You do it externally, it will flow into the seam and do the same thing for you. Now as you notice, using a liquid cement, remember I talked about having the uh, the tube cement, and when you compress it, you get it coming out. This stuff doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, it's very volatile, so it dries very quickly. So that piece is already there. It's done. Now, it isn't fully cured. It's there. It's tacked together because, it, like I say, it, it chemically attacked the plastic and softened it up. You put the piece together, and that is adhering it together but it's got to dry thoroughly and, and sort of re-harden before it's a full, you know, on your instructions that you're following carefully, it might recommend to leave something overnight before you go to the next step because they want that crucial part fully cured before you move on to the next bit. What I do when I'm building, as I'm going along with little sub-assemblies, once I've glued the parts together, I stick them right in front of the fan on the table as I go on with something else because the air passing over it helps to, uh, to dry the glue and, and, and basically the glue just has to, uh, has to, what's the word, come off, you know, and it, it's volatile so it, it's like gasoline, if you spill gasoline and it, it'll, it'll eventually vaporize completely, it's the same thing with the glue. See, even doing this as much as I do it, I, I skipped what I think is another crucial step and that's called the test fit. So, you know, when carpenters say, you know, measure twice, cut once, <laughs> in hobbies, it's similar. Take your parts that you intend to assemble. So, say I'm going to put these two airplane halves together. Take these things, and without putting any glue on them, just test fit together. Make sure it's a good fit. In this case, it's a very nice fit. Now, I cheated. There's probably a cockpit and a bunch of other things to go in there. But just for the sake of this little discussion, I test fit those parts together. They're good to go. So now I can either apply my glue to each half and put it together, or I can hold them together and run my glue into the joint like I did on the, first, on the previous example. So test fitting is always a good thing. You don't want to slather glue all over your parts and then find out, oh my god, I needed to remove this or this needed to be sanded off a bit or, or something had to be done. And it's kind of late. You've made a mess and you might have got your fingerprints on it and all kinds of stuff from the glue. So another, test it. Another good trick. So that's a fairly, fairly big piece. And you can see it, it joins together at the bottom here. But then there's a space for the cockpit and that sort of thing. Sort of a pro tip would be put your glue on this part first, glue these two parts together, make sure that they're nice and lined up, and when you're satisfi satisfied that that's glued together well, then you go on to the other part here. That way you don't risk having glue somewhere that you might put your finger on it, and it also just allows you to concentrate on one part of it at a time. If it fits here, it'll fit here, but you don't have to glue it all at the same time. It doesn't matter if this part is a little bit open like that. You can make sure that this is all glued and then go to this part. And there's a couple of things that, uh, that you can do that, um, again, not super basic, but not really very advanced either. Um, let's say you want to hold this for a long time so that it dries. Well, you can just put an elastic around it here and elastic around it there, and that'll hold it. And I guess that leads us to our next topic. So, 
as I said, and I, and, I, and I was correct, I did not mislead you, you can build any model with these four things. And, and you can build it and you can put it all together and, and if that's the end, you said, yay, I did it, I'm never doing it again, that's perfect. But you liked it and you want to go on. What should you get next? And that's, this is where the world's your oyster. Ian's thrown some examples of his stuff up there. Yeah, there's a number of little different things. Things as easy as an old toothbrush. If you have a kit where you have to do a fair bit of sanding, you want to get the sanding dust off the model before you glue it. Old toothbrush works perfectly for that. You can have almost any different kind of, of uh, clamp. You can have big clamps. You can have little clamps. You can have elastics. These things work great. The little clips, everything like that to help hold on to stuff. If you have really tiny parts to put on and you've got big fingers and you can't get them to work very well, tweezers, different types of tweezers work great. Different size sanding sticks. Let's say you want to sand something and the sanding stick is too big, you can get different sizes of sanding sticks. So there's always a little bit of, you know, everybody has their ideas and everybody has their their, their tools that they like to go to. Even little things like this is the sticky stuff that they use in schools to put up posters uh, on walls and stuff. That works great for temporarily holding pieces together. Let's say you want to see how a piece looks and make sure that it's in the right spot but you're working on something you can use these to help tack the parts into, uh, into place. Um, one of the first things you might consider getting is getting rid of your old piece of cardboard and getting yourself a self-healing cutting mat. These things are wonderful to work on. Then you do all your cutting and assembly on top of these things. Uh, Ian mentioned clamps. You know, if your mom will let you use your clothespins, these are perfect. You could have slapped one of those on there to make sure that's a good tight fit as it sets up. These are little clamps to pick up at a dollar store. You'd be amazed at what you can find at a dollar store. That's from a stationery store. It's literally used for paper. That works well on plastic. I even have somewhere in here. Ah, from electronic stores. These little soldering clips. Oh, they're amazing for putting on little tiny parts to hold them. Or in little odd spaces. See, I've got four different clips holding that wing together. And the most obscure one, I think, was also from a dollar store. It's a, it's a mini clothespin. <laughs> little, little tiny thing. It's probably for crafting and stuff, but I find in some spots that's just the bee's knees for holding that thing together. So look at all those different clamps on there. Uh, like Ian said, tweezers. I like I like the bent kind. They have a little serration on them, so they kind of grip your part, and then I can kind of I can kind of angle them in, and I can get some push on them. The straight ones sometimes they're you know, lose the part or whatever. I've got these wide guys. I think these were probably stamp tongs. Great for decals and things like that. So there's, you know, depending what you're doing and what you like to have, you know, you could have a million different types of uh, tweezers and whatnot. You're going to knives next? Yeah, so, here we go. So, when you get your knife and you put a new blade in it, the blade is gonna be nice and sharp. But as you use it to, to cut little bits off the model and, and, and scrape things and stuff, it's going to go uh, get, sure, get dull fairly quickly. So don't work with a dull blade. Get yourself some extra blades. So as soon as you find that the knife is not performing the way it was, that you can, uh, you can swap out the blade. You'll find that uh, blades are important enough that some, some heavy-duty modelers, they even buy surgical blades to use uh, because they last longer and they're, and they're much sharper. But hobby blades work great. I've, I've never used anything but hobby blades and I worked in a hospital for 25 years. I had access to blades for sure. Um, but just make sure you're not working with a, um, with a, a dull blade. Uh, files? Some people like to use files. I find usually they're a little overkill, but if you have to take a lot of material off, as opposed to a bit of material, they will cut in a lot harder and faster than a uh, sanding stick will. And they're also crucial for if you do any models that are made of metal or have metal components in them. You may need that to get the little burrs and that off the metal. Um, tape. 
There's two ways to look at tape. I use regular old masking tape. I use that for sometimes to wrap around parts instead of an elastic to hold them together while they dry. And I also use them to hold parts while I'm painting them. I don't typically use regular masking tape for masking models. Right. There are better alternatives. There's modeler's tapes, which we sell in the store. They, they uh, stick without leaving residue. When they're burnished, they give a beautiful edge. So I would save that strictly for my painting, but I would have this stuff on hand for general taping, taping down, assembly, things like that, because it's a lot cheaper than this stuff. Um, sanding, we talked about, you know, you can do most what you need to do with basic sanding sticks, okay? But it doesn't hurt to have some sandpaper as well. I like the wet and dry kind, and you get it in various coarsenesses or uh, fineness or whatever you just want to call it. Used wet, you use these to really polish the parts, like a, a regular sanding We'll get rid of that burr in that, but it might leave some scratching on the plastic. So the finer you go with this is the more smooth uh, the plastic gets and you won't see those little scratches in it. So um, there are hobby films and you can also go to your hardware store and get the silicone carbide sanding. You can get that at hardware stores, getting a tire. I mean, you have to buy a, a package of about, what, five sheets or something typically? Yeah, but you'll so go through it. You'll go through <laughs> it over time. So you have e either way of going. Um, that's for all the basic assembly. I'll just touch on this. When you put your parts together, you may not see it in this case, but in many cases you will get a little seam line. In some cases they're very small and you can uh, practically ignore them, but if they're of a decent size, just like when you're you're uh, you're doing real life construction, that you only need something like a filler or a caulking to fill those gaps, and then sand them smooth so they disappear. So this would be called filler putty, and your main considerations are: Do you want one that's um, solvent based, so it has a little bit of stuff in it that's kind of like your glue, so it will attack the plastic and adhere that way, or there are water-based alternatives. Think of it like spackle. You put that in the crack, it cleans out easily, but it, it will only adhere um, because it's there. You could easily scratch it out if you weren't careful of that. So there's, there's, there's two ways to go with that. That's a whole other topic, filling seams. We are looking for somebody to give you a presentation about that, and they'll walk through the whole process. That's a little too involved for us to cover in this little introduction, but be aware it's there. And if you're progressing in the modeling world, you will have to probably look at this and consider it at some point. Yeah, for your first model, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up on things like that. Get Get, get at this thing as good as you can and just remember that this is your first model and you know you're, you're not going to be you're not going to be an award winner right out the gate just do the best you can and, and you'd be amazed at how well they, they turn out yep we're just uh, we're just sort of taking you through the steps we told you what you need to absolutely start we gave you some ideas of all things like clamps and that to make your life easier and then of course like I do I'm jumping ahead to now you're one of us. So we're selling you all kinds of neat toys and tricks and, and things you can grow into. Like we haven't even talked about painting models. That's a whole other subculture too. If you, uh, we'll try to put a link below. I did a little talk earlier about paints and solvents. Uh, you know, it was basically all paints are acrylics, but all acrylics are not water-based paints. It'd be worth watching if you haven't painted a model yet and you want to learn about paints and solvents. I'll put the link below and you can learn about that. But this is something to consider. You've, you've built your model and now you're thinking, hey, I want to put some color on it. Yep. So that will walk you through choices. But there'll be things, once you do, you can opt to buy brush paint. We also have a very good tutorial on brush painting. Uh, Mr. Terry Jones did that for us last year. You can review that and then get some tips on brush painting. We have the spray can. You can spray. We especially recommend that for car models. A car body really doesn't look that good brush painted, but if you use a rattle can and some simple tricks, you can do that. Then if you go beyond that, if you're still with us after all that, you might consider an airbrush, which is a miniature spray gun. All the really good modelers and all the really advanced techniques in that use airbrushes, but 
that's way down the road. This yep, is not yep. for 101. That's <laughs> for when you've been with us a while and you can review our videos and step through it with us and grow along with it. Other than that, anything else you can think of? I cannot. I have I can my pin. I brought my trusty pin vise. Ah. That's a miniature drill. Okay. So when you're building these models and, and that hole isn't big enough to stick that peg in, well, when you're a basic guy and you've got basic tools, you would probably stick your X-Acto knife in there and kind of ream it out a bit. And that would probably work. But when you get to be advanced, you'd probably take a drill and drill that hole out to make things fit properly. Or you might have to drill holes where none exist because a certain variant or a certain rigging thread or something has to be done. And that would be your miniature drill miniature drill set but again this is advanced stuff this is when you've been at it a while these are things you can aspire to if you stick with the hobby so in summary I think we've covered all the basics I think we, we have cover. I think we have just remember don't don't run before you can walk don't worry about any you know nobody builds the perfect model the first time out get it as good as you can and uh, you know, learn from any mistakes that you make as you go along. It's a great hobby. Uh, lots of people do it. I, I'm impressed now seeing how many young people are getting into it. I, I thought they spent all their time on their computers, but uh, we're getting lots of young people coming in and doing it, and it warms my heart to see that because it's a great hobby. Well, yeah, you pick what you like. We, you know, there's traditional, there's cars, there's tanks, there's airplanes, there's boats, there's Gunpla, which is a uh, Gundam theme model. Lots of sci-fi subjects, Star Wars, Star Trek. I mean, the world is pretty much your oyster. And we look at 3D printing as another form of the hobby. Yeah, you 3D print those kits, but you still need these basic techniques. You need to sand, you need to glue, you need to paint, you need to do all those things that you do with a regular model. So it's just another aspect of modeling. And that might be your gateway to get into doing modeling. So basically, if you come down this path with us, the world is your oyster. You can take it as far or as little as you want. Uh, we're here to help at the Hobby Center. Anything you uh, have a question about or anything, we can walk you through it. And we are producing these YouTube videos to help you know, guide you along as well. We just told you in 40 minutes what we couldn't probably tell you in 40 seconds in the store. So we encourage you to watch these types of videos and learn along with us. Uh, next week, we hope to have somebody in here uh, walking you through the process of deckling models. Uh, decals or decals, depending on how you term it, you know, are those colored little bits, water slides that come in the kit. And for a lot of people, that's a make or break how good your model ends up looking. There's some simple techniques, and uh, Chris Wallace will walk you through them. Uh, coming up, there'll be other sessions on ship modeling. Uh, there'll be sessions on airbrushing, there'll be sessions on weathering, how to make your uh, model look worn and used and realistic. Um, we invite you to come on the journey with us, and we look forward to again to seeing you real soon. Thanks a lot for watching. Thank you. Okay, don't forget, please subscribe, slap that bell, hit that like button, and join Team Hobby Center.